Hello, my name is Andre Ward and I'm the Associate Vice President for the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and we highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone affected. We ask you, the listener and the viewer, to join Fortune Society and to spread the word about both sides of the bars. You can also share your comments on Twitter, at the Fortune SOC. Today's show is really, really important as we begin to look at and examine how people's lives are impacted once they're released from prison or from jails. So we have today some really important guests that's going to be talking about something that's really important as it relates to journeys coming home from prison. This show is entitled Free, and it's based on a new book that's been put out, Two Years, Six Lies, and The Long Journey Home. It's an award by an award-winning author and journalist, Lauren Kessler, who sets out to answer the questions about what happens to the 95% of Americans who eventually are released from prison. The book follows six formerly incarcerated individuals whose stories paint a portrait of the institutionalized roadblocks, societal stigmas, and often overwhelming societal, overwhelming psychological challenges that come with re-entering their communities. This episode's guests are Lauren Kessler, as well as one of the individuals in the book, Sterling Cuneo, a PEN America Writing for Justice Fellow who was sentenced to life without parole at the age of 16 and then spent 27 years in prison before a sentence was commuted by the governor of Oregon. Lauren and Sterling, welcome to both sides of the bars. How are each of you doing today? Thanks so much for having us. Absolutely. And for our viewers, I just want to get into a little biographical information about both Lauren and Sterling. So Lauren is a narrative nonfiction writer who specializes in exploring invisible subcultures in our midst. Um, the author of 15 books, she's written about the gritty world of maximum security prisons, the grueling world of ballot, and the surprisingly vibrant world of those with Alzheimer's. She ran a writing group for lifers inside a maximum security penitentiary and has volunteered as a mentor at a prison reentry services nonprofit. And Sterling, he's a Penn American Writing for Justice Fellow, an Oregon Literary Arts Fellow, and a two-time Penn Prison Writing Award winner with sentences to life without prison, it's without parole at 16 and spent 27 years in prison. And so he currently works as the program coordinator for the Transformative Justice Initiative at Willamette University, where he focuses on creating a paradigm shift in the Oregon criminal legal system. Again, thank you so much, each of you, for joining us here at Both Sides of the Bars. I want to kind of get right into it because this book is really significant, Laura, and certainly the work that you've been doing, Sterling, is equally significant. But I'll start with the question, you know, what are the toughest obstacles facing those released from incarceration? Not the most obvious ones, but the toughest ones from each of your vantage points. And I'll start obviously with you, Sterling, then we'll get to you, Lauren. Well, I mean, thank you for having me and Lauren in this conversation. And I mean, First, I would say that we're, you know, prisoners ain't a homogenous group. So everybody's going to have very different challenges depending on uh, the context, depending on the community that they come home to and the situation that they come home to. Whereas the obvious ones like housing is a huge win and employment is a huge one. But some of the not so obvious ones are so frequently discussed ones is just the trials and tribulations of reintegrating into a world that you don't know, particularly, you know, my peers, I come from a generation of uh, juvenile lifers. So we spent more time inside of a world without tech or, you know, healthy dynamics and then come out into a world to where we have to learn everything quickly. And so some of them challenges, you know, one of the one of the big challenges that ain't frequently talked about is the, the trauma impacts of prison. You know, it's there's I mean, it's we know how violent it is. We know how, you know, how much deprivation there is in sensitivity uh, and then a hyper vigilance inside of an environment where violence is a constant 
that's adaptive. But, you know, in the cheesecake factory, it becomes paranoia. And, you know, they, these, these, these reintegration and some of the psychological aspects of it, you know, being a fully grown adult that doesn't know anything. And, you know, these, these, these are some of the challenges that are not as well documented, but ever present. And speaking of well documented, obviously, like Lauren, right, you had like set out on a course to create opportunities for people to develop their skills in learning while incarcerated and also have documented um, the impact incarceration reintegration has on individuals. Talk a little bit about that in terms of the questions, in terms of the toughest obstacles um, that are often faced from your vantage point by people coming home from prison. Yeah, I, I really want to emphasize what Sterling said. I think when we talk about reentry, um, any to the extent that anybody talks about reentry, we often focus on uh, housing and uh, employment, and those are incredibly important. I'm not saying that they're not, but what Sterling was getting after, which is just the kind of person that you that you really have to become, especially in long-term incarceration, the protection that you create around yourself, the affect you have, the um, relationship that you have with others, that is special to that environment. And as Sterling well knows, that environment is quite toxic. Um, so that it's called prison prisonization and it creates a kind of personality. And that personality, those traits, those behaviors don't work in the free world. So I think that um, that change from being the kind of person who really can't make important decisions and doesn't, and doesn't make important decisions inside and must make thousands of decisions outside and the kind of person who has learned not to trust, but then does need to open up and be vulnerable in the free world, that I think is the hardest kind of transition, the internal, psychological, emotional transition. And that's the one that very, very few people get help with. Um, mm -hmm. Housing, you, you can in some places get help with. Employment, in some places you can get help with. But that internal that changing into the transforming into the kind of person that you want and need to be that's the tough one yeah and you know speaking of that right there are some folk on the east coast here and particularly in new york city that's working on legislation that's called um, post-traumatic prison disorder right um, really looking at and examining how the incarcerated experience impacts one while incarcerated, traumatizes them, and upon their release, they carry that trauma with them, hence the term post-traumatic, right? And so similar to someone being in the military and being deployed into a country and, and being involved in the theater of war and being released, they also have these kind of like symptoms, right, of trauma from that post kind of experience. So just wanted to note that as something that's being worked on in New York City. And, you know, but as you all talk about this, right, Lauren, you know, you've been writing about this work, Sterling, you have lived it and are also writing it during throughout the work you're doing. You know, what can we do like in the trenches, right, in our communities and our neighborhoods, right, to help those who are recently released to find a place, right, and begin like reclaiming their lives? And either um, one of you can start first. Do you want to do you want to jump in there, Sterling? Or shall I? Yeah, I mean, we can do a lot and a lot is being done, you know, and I, and I also want to preface, you know, or, or kind of before I, going forward, I want to be clear that, you know, uh, just like everybody that has been to the military or any major life transitions, uh, they they do. They are those that become effective and 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 have clear ideas and and develop loving relationships like you know in in they still there's still challenges right there's still challenges even if somebody does as good as they can do you, you know got job got family support got everything else but still face felony exclusions that are barrier that those 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 frustrations also create 
you know, some of that tension. And so one of the things that we can do and is important to do is start working with people where they're at. I mean, you know, work, start, start connecting with people inside of these institutions and having these conversations about goals or needs and how to build this relationships and moving forward. And when me be there, when they come out and help them move towards meaningful lives, you know, some of us, let's, let's, let's change the conversation from trying to define how do we help people just survive and having that be a success to focusing on how do we help people thrive in their reentry. And those conversations can occur with employers, they can occur with legislatures, they can occur with your neighbors, they can occur everywhere. And the landlords, huh? Yeah, landlords, landlord, especially landlords. Like, I'm, yeah, landlord, bank managers, bank owners, you know, like, I'm, 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 I'm right now, I'm currently barred by regulation to where I can't get a loan because of two years of employment, a non-verifiable two years of employment. And they won't count the work that I did throughout 27 years of incarceration because I was forced to work. Mm -hmm. Right. And it. so it was, uh, so there's still real barriers. So sure. it's like, you know, that is going to create a psychological stress on anybody. Right. I don't I don't care what they're back. Let, let them go through a divorce. Let them go through a death. Let them go through. Let them go through any life change and then be buried, face numerous barriers in their recovery. And it's going to create stresses right. and tensions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so anywhere that we can intervene in helping a build the individual and support those healing processes that have to occur and b dismantle some of these barriers yeah. it's that's that's how you get in the trenches get connected get connected to the people where they are and try to figure out how to get them to where they want to be absolutely lauren uh, so yeah one thing i want to say that is just slightly outside of this conversation but needs to be said is when we talk about the the toxic environment of prison and the difficulty of re-entry. I also want to say that that for some people, and, and Sterling is certainly a sterling example of this, prison also teaches resilience and perseverance. So people who get out after a long time, they actually have um, they have some strengths going for them. They have a lot of institutional barriers. They have perhaps this post-incarcerated syndrome that you're talking about, but they also have a kind of determination and um, a sense of um, that they're just, just a sense of resilience. And I think that's incredibly important and um, is uh, needs to be recognized. So the getting to your point though i think that people in the people in communities and in neighborhoods um, can actively mentor those folks who have, uh, are coming out and by mentor i don't mean be some kind of a teacher or a therapist or anything i just kind of mean hang out so in the town that i live in the city i live in there's um a wraparound services reentry program, and part mm -hmm. of that is becoming a mentor, which I have done for a couple of women. And it's just, you know, going getting a cup of coffee, talking about stuff, taking a walk, and just being a person in the community um, who is just there, saying, "Yeah, you're you're here, and I'm here, and let's just hang out." And I think that's really important. The other, very quickly, the other point is, as Sterling said, um, and as every criminologist has said for the last two decades, you start inside. You start all of this inside. Got it. The day that you get in is the day that you start thinking about getting out and the yeah, problem so to be there. Some people are of the, of the opinion that, you know, reentry starts the very moment you are incarcerated. Right. So yes. you're incarcerated, your reentry process should begin in terms of learning, developing yourself, preparing yourself for release. 
And so the other thing I want to kind of note, you know, speaking of release um, and reentry, you know, there's data out there that says, you know, after three years of release, at least 60% of people who are being released returning back to prison, right? Which is the term of like recidivism. So this notion of the myth of the mad, like talk to our viewers about what does that mean? Because again, like in New York, in New York, particularly New York State, again, I think there may be some national implications around this. Again, so like close to 60% of the people are returned back to the prison after three years or so. So talk about that. I actually just wrote uh, very recently a blog about the myth of the math of recidivism. And uh, the data from New York is uh, this very good data from New York. I mean, it's good data, but it's bad news. <laughs> right. And, and it is um, so... Um, many re there are many reasons why people go back inside. One, of the obvious one, which everybody immediately defaults to, is they committed another crime, right? And that is not um, that is not always or sometimes often what happens. It is often a um, parole violation. Yeah. Right. And sometimes it's not even a very dangerous parole violation, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Can be, yeah. And and that kind of stuff comes from, um, well, how we create the parole system and the extraordinary caseload that POs have so that they actually can't get to know who their clients are. Because if they knew, then they'd know, oh, yeah, OK, they did that because they were you know, because of some reason that's legitimate, I'm not going to tag them, they're not going to go back. But the parole violations are, um, if you cut that out and just look at people who are committing new crimes, the recidivism would go way, the level would go way down, the numbers would go way down. Sure. And your thoughts on that, uh, Sterling, this whole you myth know, of the mad? Yeah. Uh, AI I ain't never been good at math. I'm a poet, you know, that's so, but I, and, and as a poet, you know, I pay more closely attention to human behavior and, and, and my personal experience was in transformation and it was a lot of internal processes, but I also know that it's somewhat of a red herring in a way to talk about the recidivism rate, even if you, when you, when you, remove violations you can be violated for a whole that that varies county to county state to state and they can pretty much do what they want to do uh so you're going to find a lot of violations just due to personality conflicts and everything else uh so but and then those that do recommit crimes when we focus in on them one of the things that we're missing is how prepared like what resources what is what is the barriers how does this happen most people most people in my experience when they first go to prison they they want to change nobody lands in very few people may land in prison and feel like they've had any type of success in their life and they get and when you hit bottom you start trying to figure out how to put the pieces to your life together and one of the very first things you got to figure out is where you went wrong so people start looking for ways to make changes and move forward and not only be safe citizens, but productive to become resources. We, we carry we become credible messengers, you know, and we want to do redemptive work. But way before a person even gets there, they spend years and years and years in an environment where there isn't the resources or the focus for that type of goal building or pro-social activity. So what resources is put available for to even prepare for success? Mm -hmm. And then when you come out and you face all of these other challenges, both psychologically and structurally, and everything costs money, but if you're not working and you ain't got no place to live and you're dealing with all of these tensions and all of these pressures and the only seemingly available opportunities economically are, are in alternative economies, people return to crime largely sometimes for economic incentives. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you become a criminal or you become homeless. Absolutely. 
And when you think about that, Sterling and Laura, right, you know, when these barriers are eliminated and people are able to be released back to the community prepared, that is a definition, I think, at least loosely, of what to be free means, right? Because to be free is not only right to work on healing oneself while you're incarcerated, right, to address the trauma, to atone and reconcile from what you, the harm you've caused, but also when you're released, you have access to the things you need to support your transformation and transition. I think that's one definition of being free. And speaking of free, right, your book, right, Laura is entitled Free, right? So, uh, you know, what's the one thing you hope every reader gets from this book, Free? The one thing? <laughs> I mean, at least that, one thing, right, that you would hope people get from it. That's that's a really hard one to answer. Um, and I will answer it, but I do want to say of the six people that I followed, and I didn't, uh, four of those six people uh, in their uh, free world life are activists working for prison reform, right. um, working with um, social justice issues. And, um, and I think that's really important to note. I didn't choose these people because of that. That right. is the kind of people they became. Um, so there's that. I think that um, the, the big message um, for me in being involved in this book, since I had not spent time inside myself, um, I spent inside teaching writing, but not as a um, not mm -hmm. as an incarcerated individual. Right. Is that that people are capable of extraordinary change, and that um, we need to we those of us who are out in the free world need to open our minds and our hearts to the idea that someone who did harm is not all about the harm that we don't judge people by the by the very worst thing they ever did because there are because because people change and they own their flaws and they work on their flaws and sometimes people in my experience people who have been incarcerated work harder on themselves than those of us who've not faced that kind of um, momentous thing in our lives so um, people can change, and we need to give them the opportunity to do that and celebrate that change. Absolutely. And Sterling, you're obviously an example of transformation, and you went into prison at a very early age and grew out of grow, grew all obviously to become a man, right, while incarcerated, and you found redemptive space, right, through writing and empowering others while you were inside. And, and so, you know, Sterling, like, talk to us. I know that you and um, obviously Lauren have met each other, et cetera. How did you all become close friends? Oh man. So, you know, I say, I say everywhere I go, the two most transformative forces in my life was love and education. You know, loving relationships helped me in heal internally and then feel connected to others outwardly and education expanded the realm of my thinking. And, not only have I bonded with Lauren like a brother and a sister, we're both Aries and so much alike, you know, uh, but I've also learned so much in how to shape my voice and the power of personal stories, because, you know, that's the oldest, most effective way to dissolve stigma is to hear somebody's story, because what we're talking about is human beings inside of particularly challenging context, but the human heart, the human brain is the same. And when you can tell that story to help highlight that humanity, you know, that's, that's, that's incredible. And that was one of the, so that was one of the gifts that she had taught me and throughout learning and sharing and growing together you know, it's healing. And so that's how we became cool. We we just grew together. And Lauren? So I did, I started a writer's group um, at the Maximum Security Penitentiary where Sterling was incarcerated. And um, I, um, for the reasons that Sterling, I mean, I think that stories change lives. They are ways of, try, of 
you understanding who you are by telling your story. And they are ways of changing pe other people's lives when you tell your story. So the people behind bars are invisible and often voiceless. And I wanted to help make them less visible and, um, and, and help enhance their voices. So that is how we met. And I, I would say that for anything that I taught, and I, I hope that we had good moments of teaching, I learned so much more than I ever taught as a writer or as a storyteller. Um, but that's how Sterling and I met. He was one of 10 men um, in my writers group that continued um, almost right up to the time of uh, COVID when everything stopped, when there were no more visitors inside the prison. Hmm. So the Aryan writers. Right? <laughs> that's right. The Aryan writers. Aryan warrior writers. Ah, Aries, Aries, not Aryan. Aryan. Oh, oh, Aryan. No. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I said yeah, that wrong yeah. too. Yeah, Aryan is Aries, right? Yes. Aries. Yes. Yes. Absolutely April. No April. <laughs> yes. The April born folk. Let me just say yeah. that, right? Much better. So we're Thank not you. talking about the Aryan yeah, yeah. Asian, right? Yeah. We're talking about Aries folk. Mm -hmm. Aries. April. Aries. But yeah. You know, Lauren Sterling, thank you so much for you know this interview and just for this work itself. And we'll certainly look to have you back on at some point on both sides of the bars to give us an update on what's happening in your life. Um, certainly look forward to connecting with you guys on the advocacy side here on the East Coast. Um, and we just thank you. And you know, we thank all of you, the viewers, right, for viewing here at both sides of the bars. Um, we thank you for joining us for this thought-provoking conversation, as it's very important. But in the meantime, on behalf of the Fortune Society, um, we thank you for tuning in here. If you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, please check us out on the web, www.fortunesociety.org. Um, you can also uh, find us on Facebook by typing in Fortune Society. Uh, this is Andre Ward, and as always, we thank you for joining us here today on both sides of the bars. You are.